Yeah, and welcome to another video, y'all. I'm Brett Papa, and today we are gonna do some more nasty, Miss Jackson, if you're nasty, blues licks. You guys seem to enjoy the last nasty blues licks video where we kind of talked about aggressive style blues licks and you asked a bunch of questions and wanted more of this, so here you go. Now, if you also want to learn more of this kind of style and support the whole cause, check out brettpapa.com. I got all sorts of courses to teach you how to do stuff just like this, but over jam tracks and how to solo over chord progressions and all that stuff to make the fretboard more of an open, friendly space for you to create with. And there's other teachers there too, like Tim Pierce and Corey Congelio. And just check it out. There's a bunch of people. Link down below in the description box. And subscribe and click the bell if you want to see more videos like this. So anyways, one of the things I would say is tone right is one of those ways to get more of that sound you know if you listen you know it's a great album like some of my favorite blues rock nasty blues x playing of all time is uh neil sean on the departure record from journey is so good every single song has terrifying guitar playing in it whether it's super bluesy or super melodic, but the vibrato, the phrasing, the timing is all incredible. And it's all from, the genesis of that is from players like Clapton, Hendrix, you know, they were listening to all that kind of stuff. He says those two were huge influences and also, you know, trying to mimic vocalists like Aretha Franklin and stuff like that. So that's another great way to develop blues phrasing is listen to singers and try to play what they're playing, right? If you listen to a lot of the great players, there's a, uh, I think it's a nationwide at the end of the song, I believe Billy Gibbons, you can hear him like talking and playing at the same time. So he's singing the notes he's playing and the phrasing that he does on the end of that song is my hands down my favorite phrasing he does. He's another great player that has nasty blues licks, right? But the end of that song, you can hear him singing and then playing the licks on the guitar at the same time. And it's so freaking good. So. Tone is a good place to start. This is. Now, big misconception is you got to play of like a huge Marshall and a 412 cab. No, no, you don't. Some of the best blues tones ever were at a little tiny combos like a Tweed Deluxe or, you know, all sorts of little like Princeton's and stuff like that with maybe a drive pedal into it or just on their own cranked up. Sound amazing. So you don't have to have a big, huge 100 watt tube head to get a wicked sound. This is a 15 watt amp. It's a JRT divided by nine divided by 915, <laughs> divided by 13, JRT 915. I couldn't say that in my last video either. And it by itself is set up pretty mellow. Check this out. It's a 15 watt amp on the nine watt setting, six V6 tube. So it's definitely not a Marshall. You can get full like, So it's got a little bit of breakup, which is always the first place I start. I never play completely clean ever. Never, never, never. And the reason is because once you get in a band scenario, it, it reads a tone like that. It's going to sound like it's clean once it's with all the other instruments. Hardly anybody like any of the session guys, any guys in town, you know, that play hardly any of them play squeaky clean. There's always a little bit a breakup or on the edge of breakup. So that's a great place to start with your tone. Then I stacked a couple pedals together. I have the Archer, the Rocket Archer, but the Jeff pedal, it's the Jeff Beck version. So if I add that. And then my new favorite pedal is the Nordvang 83 drive. And this is gonna be on the blues breaker side. Okay. 
Okay, so keep in mind, that's a nine watt amp, right? Going into an open back cabinet. <laughs> and it sounds huge, right? So you don't have to have the big 412 and the closed back cab and the you know 100 watt head and all that stuff. But tone is a big part of it because it lets you really dig in and get some of that sustain. So if you wanna do licks where you can, you know. <laughs> have lots of sustain, you got kind of something to help push you into that, right? And also it helps get that kind of... But the key when you stack pedals is don't have the gain up too much. Keep the gains at about, you know, I have two gain pedals stacked, right? One's a boost and one's a gain, but the drive on both of them is about nine o'clock because if you start getting too much, the dynamic, the way that you can pr you know, play with the volume and the notes and the sound starts to diminish the more you get more and more gain. So try to clean up your playing a little bit as far as gain goes, but you can still stack and have a great time. Just keep the, the drives below noon if you're thinking about a clock, right? So that's step one. Step two, is start to think about little ways that you can make a note sound more aggressive. There's many ways to do that. One of them is just subtle, you know, that kind of micro bend thing, like if we're in A. Versus. All right, listen to. Like tug on the note, hang on the note, and pull it a little bit, right? So I'm just pulling down a little bit. And then. That's another thing I like to do and I talk about it in my courses a lot, especially the caged course, is when I do blues licks, throw the notes of the chord in there, right? So if we're playing over like a. like the minor third, root, the fifth of the chord, and then maybe slide into it. And then back to the third. The reason that's gonna sound killer is you just played an A minor chord, right? <laughs> Literally, the only thing I did was just tweak the notes of the actual A minor chord. Now, one of the parts of that sound that made it sound big was the rake. And then I tweaked the note a little bit, right? So. Oh, somebody's gonna ask. This is a new guitar. Jeff's in guitars. Awesome guitars. Local builder in Nashville. Wicked guitar player killer guitar maker. Let's see, all Lawler pickups, special, 64 tweed. I think it's like 50s pickups, so that's the pickups. But anyways. So I'm just pulling down and tweaking that out a little bit. And then raking. I'm hitting. I'm raking and muting with my palm and I'm heavily muting all the notes right above the note I want to hit. The first two places I noticed people doing this was Joe Satriani's song called Circles. So Joe Satriani, Surfing with the Alien, Circles, you'll hear him do that. And then David Gilmore does it all the time, right? So that's the first time I consciously was like, what is that? But it adds so much feel to your note. Okay, so another way is to tag some notes and mute others, right? And I kind of cut those off, right? So I let one pull, right? I did. Okay, so pulling it. 
That's another just hole in that note a little bit. Right, mute. Again, that kind of stacking thing, one note right on top of the other. Okay. Now, another thing that's cool to do is we all want to resolve to a chord tone, right? So if I'm playing over that, or, you know, it's cool to do and get that resolution, right? Landing on the root and then add another note at the very end or like uh, Stevie Ray when he does like the riff to nowhere, right? So add a little bit of nuance to it, slide into it. That's a great way, sliding in. The phrasing, it's not fast, just because you know it's called nasty doesn't mean it's gotta be technically challenging, right? Now notice how I'm like really smacking some of those notes not pressing hard, right? That's the one thing you got to get used to. I think when you start to attack notes over here, your body naturally wants to tense everything up. And that is not what you want to do. You want to keep this as light of touch as you possibly can. I, I always say this, and I even say it to players that have been playing a while, take a dead note, right? Let's just take the third fret and just hit it mute and put like the most minute amount of pressure you can on the string and every time you pick add another minute amount of pressure to the string until you get a fretted note and then notice how lightly you really have to press on the fret to get it to make a note chances are you're pressing way too hard and then that's one of those things like when your guitar is in tune, but it sounds out of tune, you're like, but it says it's in tune and it's not in tune. That'd be you. <laughs> that would be called user error. And I'm not disparaging you in any way. Somebody pointed that out to me. They're like, no, man, your guitar is perfectly in tune. It's you. I was like, what do you mean? They're like, you're pressing too hard. So that's one thing you got to be aware of, especially when you start trying to dig in over here. And digging in over here also doesn't mean clenching your fist so you're you know, trying to squash your pick into an even thinner gauge. You just hold it enough to where it doesn't fly out of your hand, but you can smack the note, you know, add that. That doesn't mean you need to tense up and press really hard, right? So it's about staying loose and fluid so you can do those kind of sliding fluid licks and get around easier without really getting in your own way, right? Okay, so another way is to add that muting, right? And those snapping those notes, maybe a little. David Gilmore does this all the time. Pinch harmonics, killer stuff, that kind of throaty. <laughs> Billy Gibbons, of course, right? Now, the way you do that is you take your pick. Those are called pinch harmonics. Some people call them squealies. There's, they're called a bunch of different things. You take your thumb and your pick, and the thumb and pick want to hit the string at the same time time. So you want a piece of your flesh of your thumb to actually be hitting the string at the same time. So you got to kind of angle your pick a little bit, right? And it matters where you place it on the string.
but I'm, I'm, I kind of tilt my wrist a little bit, right? Like this rather than, you know, I'm usually like this, but I'll tilt it in a little bit to get that side of my thumb, like this part of my thumb right there to touch with the pick at the same time. If you got a Strat or, or even if you got a Les Paul or whatever you got, uh, a Strat, I'm just saying, because right above this middle pickup, you'll be able to get the easy ones, right? And you'll have to mess around and, and move it around and it'll take a little bit. Gain helps, right? You don't need it like Metallica gain, but you want something. Or if your amp is cranked up, it'll be easier to get it. And then when you add the subtle bends, like what we've been doing already, it'll start to sound huge. Now notice I just tweaked those notes, all those notes a little bit. That's that first phase, right? The non-technical phase is just those micro bends. It adds so much feel. Now, the other way to make a blues lick nasty is to bend up to a note, but take your time. Maybe rise into it and come back down and then back into it. Right, so. I'm not getting all the way to the pitch, just a little bit, back down, and then back up. So... So lingering on those notes, right? So it was at pitch and then at the last second, I add a little bit of that micro bend. Okay, so this is the, the flat five, if you're in minor. The first song I heard that in is David Lee Roth's Bump and Grind. There's a uh, part where he's like... I don't know what the lick is. It's freaking killer. But that was the first time I heard that and really was like, what is that? You know, Van Halen does it all the time. For some reason, the first time I consciously was aware of like, what is that sound was when I heard Steve I do it even though I've been listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan for forever, and he does it all the time. I don't know why it took me so long, but the flat five is an awesome. Awesome way to start to sound nasty. You don't necessarily want to land on that note and stay there. I call it the hangover note. And I love this. Right? Right, so again, tweaking those notes. A little of that pinch harmonic. A little of that flat five. And then, you know, riff to nowhere. Now sliding. God, I got a cut right here. <laughs> I was making a smoothie. I was like washing my blender and it was just like slice. And I was like, God! and it's just right on the tip of my finger. So every time I do vibrato or bend one of those notes, it's like cut and slice and raw flesh. So if it's a little off, see it's even bleeding. God dang it. Okay, so. 
So I do that all the time. I slide into notes. That's another way. There's two kinds of slides. There's the two note slide. And then there's the quick slide where it's like one note. This one. Tim Pierce. When I was filming a lot with him back in the beginning, back in the day when we first were putting videos up online, he was the first guy that I really noticed that quick slide, that like one note slide. And I was like, oh, that's how they pocket those licks with the beat and are able to change positions so quickly, like move through the pentatonic scales fast, but not have too many notes, right? So it's easy to switch and slide from position to position really quick and make it sound like one fluid but quick lick and get through positions without having to have too many notes. You know, by the time it's like the drummer's like psh, hitting that cymbal and you're like, wait a second, I got four more notes to slide into beat one. <laughs> so a quick slide, that's another thing. Now, if you'll notice a lot of players do like kind of slides, right? That's another nasty lick. It's that flat five. Right, but you just... Another way to do it. Reaching outside of the scale. So here's a minor pentatonic. Well, it sounded great when we added this note outside the scale on the flat five. What if we just did that in all the positions? This one, that's actually adding the major third of an A chord, right? Into a minor chord, which is always a killer sound. But for me, three notes per string are a lot easier to play than two notes fast. You know, there's the Eric Johnsons and the Philip Saces and all these guys that just burn on two notes per string. I'm not that dude. I need I need good three notes to really get cooking. <laughs> so anytime I can sneak in a three note per string pentatonic lick, I love it. And that's one of the ways I really am able to develop speed, but it also adds a nastiness to the lick. Or when you start mixing major and minor, and I got a whole course coming out on mixing major and minor really soon with like 10 wicked jam tracks. I'm so freaking pumped. Oh, it's gonna be good. So. That's another way to get the nasty licks. Now that doesn't necessarily always work like if I was doing.
Like adding that major third doesn't necessarily work in there, but in more kind of hard rock, just kind of fun Southern rock, you know. It works great, right? So you can add that when it's kind of five chords, especially it's not committed to a major or minor sound. Then it's easy to sneak that kind of major third in there. Now the one trick to that, and I've done a whole live stream on mixing major and minor before too. So check that out if you want to go a little bit more in depth and kind of get the idea. But the way I started kind of doing it was I took a minor pentatonic scale and I put a major pentatonic scale inside of that. Now I use minor as my framework because I was more familiar with the minor scale. I since can now can do it with, you know, major the other way around. But I would say start with minor, take box one. And if you're in box one, the major pentatonic shape, and they're the exact same shapes, right? So shape one, A minor, shape one, A major, right? Same shape. Minor, shape one will have major shape two inside of it. When you add those together, you get all that killer. Right, so I'm adding. And then together. So you get and then when I add those in it as well. So now you got Same note. So. That's just a pattern. And then adding like. Right? Which we've already done. And then adding that major third. Right, so that's another way to do it. So tone, get it, get a little bit more of a tone on your on your hands. Tweak those notes, those subtle bends that adds so much emotion to your playing. So it's those little bends. Spend some time getting to the bend or get to it, raise down and then back up. Spend some time on that bend. A little vibrato. Add a little stamp at the end. Or something, a little stamp on the end of the note. Then you can add the outside notes. Right? 
Add that major third. The outside notes right here too. This is the right, so you got this note. Right? It's right here too. And then when you add that major box inside the minor, you get all that. So that's major two. But when you make that with minor, when they mix and mingle together like a little dance of love. Starts to sound epic. And then the, the slide, quick slides. And then the one note slide. All that stuff will start to really, really, really make your licks sound more tough. Now I did some fast playing there. You can always speed up, but man, I, if, if you're gonna listen to some players that are really going to be kind of that ground floor nasty blues licks, David Gilmore, Billy Gibbons, Angus, um, that aren't fast. Who else? I mean, there's a million. Clapton, obviously. Hendrix, obviously. Um, I would say Stevie Ray Vaughan, but his stuff gets challenging because there is some speed involved. Um, but those are some good places to start. If you want to see where it goes to and what you can aspire to, you may not like the bands per se, but I'm going to say Warren D. Martini of Rat and Van Halen and um, Neil Sean, Steve Lukather, are guys who, who really keep the blues really in their playing. Like it's mostly blues licks with some outside notes thrown in. Those guys are amazing. Like I said, that Journey Departure record is some of the best blues rock guitar playing of all time. It, when, he, when you want to sound like the blues still, you know, there's obviously players like Van Halen that sound blues rock, but Neil keeps a blues pentatonic sound and then adds other stuff to it. And it's just ripping playing. But the phrasing, the timing, the dynamics, the attack, the just everything is is like to me is complete textbook. I think if I was going to play like anybody, obviously I love Van Halen, but Neil Sean to me is like the perfect blues rock guitar player because he just has, well, so does Eddie, but blues <laughs> rock. Uh, Neil, definitely. Listen to those early Journey albums. The playing is just freaking phenomenal. And so young. Him and Eddie, it's like, how on earth? Jimmy too. Any of these guys, how do they get so good so young, right? But anyways, and then... Take the advice of uh, Neil and all these guys. Learn from the greats. You know, you got, again, you got your Gilmores, you got your Gibbons, you got Eric Clapton, you got Hendrix. Listen to those because their phrasing is killer. But also start to try to find out and mimic vocal phrasing. That'll add a real kind of sass to your playing, like good R&B singers because their vibrato is really good too. Try to match those notes and their vibrato and the feel of their notes because you know those micro bends you're gonna hear singers do that kind of stuff all the time all right so those are some other tips for nasty blues licks again if you want to support the cause it makes everything possible go to brettpapa.com i got the caged unleashed course which really will open up the fretboard like nothing else the cage system to me was the home run for me personally to understand the fretboard, and then I got Hendrix Unleashed too. If you like that Hendrix style, I want the double stops and add that kind of blues element. I go through a lot of this kind of stuff in that course as well. And then keep the ears and eyes out for the mixing major and minor course coming out soon as well. And that's a deep dive into all this stuff as well. And you guys are amazing. This is all because of you, and I never forget that. Love the comments. I'll try to answer all the comments too. So if you got any questions, let me know. You can support the cause also by, I put all my gear that's available in one place 
on my Sweetwater page, divided by 13s and stuff like that are also listed down there. The guitar makers of the other guitars that I use, all the stuff that isn't available there is also listed in the description box down below. So if you're interested in that stuff, some of those links help me out. The you know, the Sweetwater stuff, I get a little cut off that, but everything else is just down there because I love the people, whether it's the guitar makers, the amp builders, I don't get anything off of that, but that's just my favorite stuff. And those guys are amazing. So if you wanna support the little guys, check out the stuff down below as well. You guys are so freaking awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the continued support. We'll catch you next time.